So today's our last class. And what I wanted to cover today is something that I've perceived over the years as one of the biggest stumbling blocks in learning Super Collider. And it's also something that took me a while to figure out a system that worked for me. The topic is uh, essentially putting everything together into a code, sort of large scale code architecture that's coherent, robust, foolproof, and as much as possible optimized for performing or you know, doing whatever that program is supposed to do. And I have prepared a whole bunch of uh, clean yet somewhat messy code uh, in, in preparation for this lecture. Everything we've been doing so far this semester is, um, for the most part, using SuperCollider on a line-by-line -line basis, writing s.boot and running that, writing a synth def and evaluating that, and then making some synths, running those. Uh, this is one of the benefits of SuperCollider is that it's this higher level interpreted language where code is evaluated, you know, chunk by chunk. It's very selective. It's optimal for live coding and just kind of testing and messing around and things like that. You don't have to write the whole program up front and run that. It's kind of nice. but there are lots of situations where uh, you actually do want to write the program completely. Let's say if you have some elaborate composition that you're going to be performing, you don't really want to have to get up on stage and s.boot, wait a few seconds, run your synth def, scroll down, scroll down, run this, run that, allocate your buffers, da 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 da. I mean, you can do all this ahead of time in sound check and things like that, but it's desirable. I don't think. There's, uh, I don't have to make the case too strongly here that it's desirable to have everything in one chunk. You just hit command enter on the whole thing and everything, all the dominoes get lined up and then you knock down the first domino and, and the piece runs. Um, so that is what we're going to focus on today. And as we do, keep in the back of your mind that the general structure I like to work with is to divide the code into two, two large sections. The first of which is uh, I would call setup code, and the second chunk would be performance code. So the setup allocates buffers, you know, boots the, ser boots the server, first of all, allocates buffers, adds synth defs, defines various global variables, arrays, collections, patterns, you name it. Uh, doesn't actually play anything just yet, but it just sets everything up. And then you know your second chunk, which could be below or even in a separate super collider file, is where you have your actual performance events. It might be a chronological sort of thing where you step through some things. You could make a build a GUI where you have just a button you click or something like that, or it could be something a little more interactive where you can dynamically turn things on. Everything which involves playing the piece in some way. Okay, so here let's take a look at the code that we have here. I have this file called initial code. And I've just, this morning I just made a bunch of material kind of based off previous material. Nothing we haven't really seen before. So at the top, we boot the server. And then I have four synth steps. One is called beep. This is a sine wave with a fixed duration envelope. It goes out, it gets panned, and it has two outputs. One is considered the sort of main output straight to speakers. And I also have a second output channel which is the same signal, but it's going to a different bus, which is theoretically being listened to by some effect. And we have a separate uh, gain stage for the effect send. This is the second one here, beep ASR, attack, sustain, release, is almost the same thing, except it has a sustaining envelope, so it can be sustained indefinitely with a gate argument. This one here is very similar, except the sound source is a play buff. So uh, we are going to have some sound file that we load into a buffer, and then we can you know, play it with some start position, with some playback rate, uh, and everything else is pretty much the same. And then I have a reverb, and I'm just using free verb 2 because it's easy. So we take a stereo signal in, we split it into its mono components because that's what free verb 2 requires, two mono signals, and then it's just a big, uh, big wet reverb effect, and also going through a low-pass filter. So Nothing too complicated here. I'm, I'm trying to make sound sources which are, you know, synth steps which are simple and basic enough that we can maybe pretend that we're putting together a piece and these are our instruments, as it were. So the beep sounds like this. Very simple. You can add 
arguments like we always do. And this is our sustaining version. All stuff we've seen before. And then I got a little fancy and tried to do something, you know, just, just to reinforce the fact that you don't necessarily need complex synth depths to make complex sounds. So this is a, a little chunk of code <coughs> which makes an array of eight random numbers. And then it uses this, I don't remember if we've covered this, but there's a method called nearest in scale where you then provide uh, an array of scale degrees, which I'm just using the scale class as a convenience here. So I'm taking the minor scale and I'm basically rounding each of these numbers to the nearest scale degree. So it's, it's a way of doing musical quantization. I sort them so it's lowest to highest. So it looks something like this. These are all uh, MIDI note numbers in, I believe the default is C minor. That's if you just don't, you know, we can, we can shift this and make it C sharp minor or something like that if we wanted to. So it makes this array, posts it so we can see it, and then iterates over it and uh, replaces each item with an array of items. The, the number, you know, plus zero, and the number plus some random amount. So it's basically taking each pitch value and, and, and copying each one and detuning slightly one of them. This gives us a beating effect because instead of just a static chord with no detuning, each voice has a, has a slightly detuned pair. So it's kind of a nice effect. And then we use flat because the result of this is an array of arrays. Right? Each one is an array containing the original note number and the detuned version, the note number, the detuned version. Right? And we don't, we don't want this. So flat is, is a way of just removing the inner arrays and just kind of making it from a two-dimensional array to a one-dimensional array, which is what we want. And then we iterate over that. Now that we have this twice as big pitch collection with some nice detuning effects, we make a synth for each one. So the MIDI note number gets converted to cycles per second. The lowest ones are louder. This is a reciprocal amplitude relationship. So the, you know, the index counter, the, the lowest notes are 0.1 divided by one. And then as we get higher, it's 0.1 divided by two, 0.1 divided by three. So the amplitude gets quieter. As we get higher, the envelope parameters are somewhat randomized and it sounds like this. Uh, this is almost the same thing. Uh, the difference is that I'm using the sustaining synth depth. So I'm giving the array, I'm giving the, the eventual collection a name called notes. And I, I guess I've transposed the scale for some reason here as well. Um, but the result is the same, except the notes sustain indefinitely. So they'll turn on and they'll just stay on until we um, collect or, or iterate in some way over the collection and set each one's gate argument to zero. This is one of, one of a number of just dichotomies in computer music. You have sounds which have a finite lifespan and sounds which have an infinite lifespan. And I like to, I, I do this a lot. I have one synth def, it makes a sound and it's got a finite duration. And then I say, sometimes I wanna turn one of these sounds on and, and leave them on until further notice. And so I just make another version with a different envelope. And I've also added, uh, so let's turn this on again. I've added another chunk of code here, which iterates over the notes and sets each frequency uh, to a, a new random value. I'm just picking another ordered array, of random numbers quantized to the nearest scale. I think it's, it's going to be a different scale because this one is uh, E minor, this one's going to be C minor, and it just says set the frequency to each corresponding item. And I also have a little bit of a lag on each one, so there'll be a slight glissando. Did we cover lag in this class? We did? Well, I'll just, I'll, uh, just in case we didn't, these, uh, the frequency argument uh, has been lagged. You say the name of any argument and you can say dot var lag, variable lag, you can also say dot lag, very similar, but uh, basically we give it an interpolation time and an interpolation curve. So whenever, the, whenever this value changes, if it changes from A to B, instead of snapping from A to B, it's going to take this much time to get from A to B and it's going to have a sort of logarithmic shape. 
to it. So it's going to get close very quickly and then level out. And um, that's just, I thought that was sort of a nice effect instead of just changing all of the frequencies of the 16 synths immediately. You know, you get the idea. Just making sounds here. Just making some interesting sounds. And then here's a, you know, we can do patterns as well. Nothing fancy here, just using the synth def. I'm using a minor pentatonic scale and scale degrees. It just goes from scale degree zero up the scale to so a total of 11 pitches I heard. That's 11. Okay, so, you know, and then we can, in, at least in the compositional, we're just messing around. This is, this is totally fine. There's not as much of a need to build everything into a coherent singular structure. But, you know, it's good to put comments and say, you know, like this would be, you know, some sequence to happen at, I don't know, measure 12 or something. Right? You can put notes to yourself where things are supposed to go chronologically. Um, okay, so we, I have this one sound file. Oh, and, uh, yeah, okay, so in the uh, lecture code, uh, I've, I've taken the, uh, ahead of time, I've put the code and an, a folder of audio files in the project. We've, we've seen this before. So I just have this one flute uh, whistle tone sample. Just kind of whistle tone and key clicks and stuff like that. So that's over here. I'm using this process now executing path uh, to get the relative path name and then load the buffer, load the audio file into buffer B. I'm just reading um, the left channel because that's how I've designed my sample synth def. It expects a one channel buffer. And then I did a similar thing here, just messing around with, with synths and patterns. And then here is a, like a sort of clustery sample. Uh, what's basically going on here is that I'm making 16 uh, random numbers and feeding those in as uh, detuning values for this frequency. The, the bass playback rate is relatively low. It's an octave plus change below normal. Each one's slightly detuned. Some of them go backwards. Uh, they're panned randomly and they all start, you know, somewhere in the half second or so into the file. And we could do, you know, start somewhere else. Make the playback rate higher. Lots of options. We turn the numbers, you know, turn the knobs, change the numbers, whatever. And then this is um, a pattern which does something interesting. Uh, so briefly, what's going on here is uh, for each synth it creates, well, it's creating them every one twentieth of a second. So they're happening pretty quickly, and I'm using P series to. Uh, move the start position of each event ahead in the buffer by 250 frames. So the first, play, the first synth starts at frame zero, the next one starts at frame 250, then 500. So it's kind of stuttering along the file. Uh, these are just the um, envelope parameters of each one. I'm using pgom to um, uh, change the playback rate. Um, Geometrically, multiplicatively. So that's that's the pitch, the pitching down. Each sample is is going down by a, a half of a semitone, which is this playback ratio, 0.97 or so. And then this is a clever. I forget if I don't think I've shown this. Have we? We might have seen P seg at some point. P seg is basically the envelope version. Of, it's the it's the pattern which represents an envelope. So you can specify pattern values inside of P seg to you determine the points, the times, and the curves. And I fairly recently realized that you can just write an envelope and say dot as pseg, and it handles the pseg creation for you. So this is just an envelope that goes from one to zero over seven seconds with a curve value of minus four. It's being used for amplitude. Um, so this, this makes the entire event stream uh, seven seconds long, and I don't have to worry about this complicated pseg thing. Yeah, 
So interesting stuff going on here. OK, and we have this reverb synth. So we clear any buses that might be in existence, or reset the bus counter, make a two-channel bus, make a synth. And here's another pattern. It goes on forever. And the, you know, it's a bunch of random numbers, mostly. It, it goes out to speakers, but we're also activating the auxiliary send, which is built into the synth def. So it goes to the reverb bus. Uh, and this is the send amplitude. So it's going to be you know, kind of low relative to the main amplitude. But we'll definitely hear some reverb. I also made some, some MIDI stuff, so we'll, I think I already connected my MIDI devices ahead of time. But I've got this um, MIDI keyboard over here. And so I have two MIDI receiver objects, one which is listening for the pitch wheel, and it just updates a global variable and also sets the rate of any synth. So it's, actually, it makes sense to look at this one first, I think. So uh, this is getting note on messages and creating a sampler synth from each one. And instead of mapping note number to playback rate to like be able to play a scale and stuff like that, I'm, I'm just doing something a little bit different just for fun. And the, um, the note number determines the start position in the buffer. So, you know, we can, if I just play a chromatic scale, I'm doing something kind of similar to what that previous pattern just did, right? I can start at the beginning or somewhere in the middle or somewhere at the end. It's just, it's just kind of a, a cheap way of chopping up the sample into little segments and mapping them to keys. Uh, velocity is being used to control amplitude so in the conventional sense. And uh, the playback rate is determined by this pitch wheel value. So basically, as, the, as I move the pitch wheel, I'm updating this global value, which is used to initialize the rate, the playback rate, of any synth. Uh, but whenever the pitch wheel moves, it also uh, sets the rate parameter of anything in this source group. And I'm putting each one of these synths in the source group as well. Maybe it would help to bring up the, the node tree here. So I'm going to hit command period to clear this. And then we'll run this code here. So this creates two groups, a source group and an, a reverb group. And it puts the reverb synth in the tail group. We've seen this kind of thing before. and then. If we run, uh, activate these uh, MIDI devices here now, we should be able to play a little sound. And you can see they're getting placed into the, the group at the head of the tree. And the, you know, the effects output bus is the reverb. And so everything's nicely connected. And we can play, play with the pitch wheel a little bit. And this is all kind of live, so we could even play this pattern. They're not going into the group, but it doesn't matter because they're uh, upstream of the reverb, so that's the only thing that really matters. It's a good one. some weird bird song. OK, this is what I came up with. And now the question is, how do we make this more manageable? We've got code all over the place. Um, you know, how, do we, how do we perform this? And the, really, the first step is to uh, decide how you're going to be able to perform it and be able to express that you know, in, in plain words, in plain English or something. It's like, well, is this going to be a chronological piece? Are we going to define sort of a, an opening gesture and then a second one? Or, um, you know, it, it's possible we might just use this to generate material, write it to an audio file, and then dump it into a DAW and work over there. There's lots of possibilities. But uh, let's, let's imagine, I think a, a, a reasonable goal here is to conceptualize this as raw material for a, a piece that has chronologically oriented events, which we're going to somehow step through. OK, so I have this. Uh, we'll save this. It's, it seems fine. Um, and I just wanted to uh, we'll hit command period, clear everything off. The main issue 
is that we've got two programs we're dealing with, the language and the audio server. And there are certain things, certain things need to happen in certain order, in a certain order. That you cannot play a synth until you have added the corresponding synth def. One needs to happen first, and then the second thing can happen. You can't play a buffer until you have read that audio file into a buffer. And you can't read an audio file into a buffer until you've booted the server. So there's a whole hierarchy of things that need to happen. Um, let me, let's, okay, here we, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to take this and paste it over here. And we have the server booted. And I'm going to change the name of this synth def so that it's uh, 0001. And in the same clump, we're going to make an instance of this synth. So the server's booted. Uh, take a moment and, and try to f guess what's going to happen if we just run this clump uh, in one go. All right. Server's booted. We have a synth def, and we're playing a synth. What happens is uh, we get an error. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's sort of an error. Most of the errors in SuperCollider, I guess, are in red text. This is a, more of a more of a warning almost. Uh, it, the, I, I don't know exactly if it's the language of the server telling us this, but we, the user, we get. Uh, I don't have this synth def. It's not in my. And we, and we say, what do you mean? I just added it. You know. So let's run this again. And this time it works just fine. OK, so here's what's happening. On the first evaluation, we add a synth def. And at that moment, the, the language does some stuff. And it, it, it begins a process of evaluating that code, parsing it, uh, compiling it, whatever, and translating it into the necessary OSC messages that need to get sent over to the server in order for the server to build the unit generator graph function and write the necessary synth def file. And a non-zero amount of time is what this takes. But here in the language, we're going boom, boom, right? One and immediately then the other. We're just telling the server, add this synth dev. Oh, and by the way, play the synth right now. And th the server is not ready. The server is still in the process of receiving the first command, uh, which is why it works fine on the second time, because it only really takes a few, I don't know, probably less than a millisecond for it to, I don't exactly know how much time. There's probably some way to figure it out. But it's not a lot of time. But it's more time than we're giving it. So if we you know, change this to beep 0002 and try to do it again, we're going to get the same problem. It's going to say beep 0002 not found. But then if we run it again, we're all good. So what's the solution here? The, something that might come to mind is to put these in a routine and say, you know, wait for a second before doing it. We have a routine. We add the synth f, and then we play it. So this works, but it's dumb. <laughs> it's dumb because, you know, we uh, how how do we how do we know how long exactly we're supposed to wait? One second is enough. Is a half second enough? A quarter second? You know, a millisecond? It's it's um it's bad. Right? This is not this works, but it's it's not the best solution. Um, uh, what we want to do is is uh, add the synth def and then somehow tell the server, let me know whenever you're done, whenever you've got no more tasks in the queue. And the way we do that is with uh, s.sync. So this is a message that goes to the local host server. And it asks the server to reply with an OSC message of its own to the language when it has finished everything it has been told to do. Uh, and this this must be inside of a routine of some kind. It has to be. In, it's in. It, has to, it can only be in the same. It's only allowed where one dot wait and things like that are also allowed. So if we just highlight the the stuff here and, and try to try to do this, uh, we're going to get probably a yeah the same kind of error we would get if we tried to do one dot wait here. Um, and I think now we actually need to change this again because we've actually added that synth def. So once it's in a routine, we're all good. It just happens pretty much immediately. Um, it's very fast, but it just needed a little bit of extra time. And s.sync ensures that the server has that time before, it, before it's asked to play a synth. 
So um, even better than this, uh, because we still have not incorporated the booting of the server into this. Right? So is there some way we can? Uh, uh, I, 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 I've never actually tried this, but my my first thought is to do this. I wonder if this will work, but I don't think it will work because you can't tell the server to wait until it's you know until it's idle if it hasn't already booted because it's not fully awake yet or something. It's like telling someone to make breakfast and they're like still in bed or something. I'm getting up. I'm getting to it. But let's try it anyway, just to see if this works. I don't think it's going to work. Doesn't work. Right. I think the server did not receive this sync message because it had just begun the booting process. But there's a better way. And that is, instead of putting it in a routine, we put it in a wait for boot function. Okay. So wait for boot is a message. It's a, it's a method that we can send to the server. Uh, and we provide, along with that message, a function. And what the server does is it boots itself. And when the booting process is complete, it evaluates the function. And as a bonus, uh, it implicitly creates a routine, which means we are allowed to use s.sync without having to add an additional routine layer inside this function. So if we quit the server and run this code, what will happen is it will boot. As soon as booting is complete, it begins evaluating this function, so it adds a synthf, receives a sync message, and then as soon as it's ready, plays the synth. Ah, lovely. It's exactly what we want. This, um, so the, the same principles apply, for example, if you want to load a file into a buffer and then play it. Let's, let's observe uh, just, just for fun. Uh, let's go find a... I guess we'll just we'll save this as a temp in lecture code, and we'll copy the buffer stuff wherever it is. Where is it? There it is. Uh, and we'll just say b.play. And before we do this, let's just see what happens we do it the wrong way. So uh, one by one, I think it's fine. No, we haven't booted the server. OK, we'll boot the server real quick. So get the path, load the buffer, and play it. Works just fine. If we say buffer.free all, or just b.free, I guess. No, let's do buffer.free all, just to be extra sure. And r try to run this clump of three lines all at once. Does not work. Does not work. We get error, a play buff, wrong number of channels, nil. And it's not even going to work on the second time, I don't think. Just get the same thing every time. Not going to work. It fails for the same reason, but kind of manifests in a slightly different message. It's one of the challenges where it's like a, a, a very easy to solve problem, but you get a tons of different uh, you know, ways it's communicated to you. Um, this line is fine because this line has nothing to do with the server. This is pure language side. It's not asking for any information. It's just creating a string. Then we, this, is a, this is an OSC message. This, this line here results in an OSC message. We say, OK, read the following file into a buffer, call it B. And so the language evaluates it and begins communicating with the server. And it says, here's your file. Allocate a buffer. And the server says, great, I'm going to allocate this buffer and begin filling it with samples. and you know, that again takes some amount of time. And it doesn't update the buffer's attributes, like number of channels, number of samples, sample rate, buff num, until it's finished allocating. So if we try to play the buffer before the um, allocation process is complete, the buffer does not have any information on its number of channels, on its sample rate, on anything. So this, this b.play. Um, implicitly creates a, a play buff. It's, it basically makes a little function dot play with a play buff in it. And it tries to get the number of channels from the buffer, but it's not, it hasn't been given a value yet. So we just can't do it. So if we uh, put this in a routine, I think this will work. 
So if we free all, so now we have a routine which is going to do these things first, tell the server to wait until it's done doing stuff, and then play it. Beautiful. Works just fine. Let's just confirm. Did we actually free buffer? Yeah. Totally works. And we can also do this. Right, this is exactly what we were doing a second ago. Quit the server, so everything's gone. Boot the server and evaluate the function. So s dot. There's no need to do s dot boot when you're using wait for boot. It's it's sort of an alternative to s dot boot, but allows you to say and do this as soon as you're booted. Very handy. This wait for boot is often the um, kind of the centerpiece of writing uh, writing code, which is an all-in-one sort of robust, comprehensive, coherent structure. So let's try to uh, translate this initial code into at least the first half, the, the setup code, where we boot the server, add the synth depths, load the buffers, anything else we need to do. So it's going to look like this, probably, at least. And once the server is booted, we'll add these synth depths. So copy and paste. Right. Uh, and what we can also do is load the buffer, which I guess we'll copy it from here. And I, I should add here that there's not one order that will work. There's, there's different ways to do it. Some things don't rely on each other. Like, you know, whether you load your buffers first or add your synth depths first, doesn't really matter because those two don't rely on each other. Synth depths just define signal interconnectivity. Buffers just read samples into memory. So there's multiple ways to do it here, but I'm just going to do one possible way that will work. Uh, so we'll do, and that also means we don't need to say s.sync. However, I do think that this belongs before we boot the server, just because this is a a global variable which has nothing to do with the server. Uh, you might have a lot of other global variables, like maybe just a, a collection of numbers that represent pitches, or you know a, a, a Boolean global vari variable that represents whether something is on or not. You know, uh, maybe GUI stuff would go. But you know, it's so we're gonna we're gonna take this out and put it uh, here. Okay. So the first thing we're going to do is deal with pure language side stuff and then boot the server and get that rolling. All right, what else do we need to do to set things up? Uh, probably make our groups. And also, if we have any effect synths, we might want to instantiate those right away. You know, they don't make sound by themselves, but we'd like to, you know, basically turn them on and ha make them active so that as soon as sound flows in, they start processing signal. Okay, so we need, uh, let's, let's put the buffers at the top. I, for, I don't know why I'm changing my mind. I guess it's because I'm a crazy person. Doesn't really matter, it can go down there. I don't know why. Uh, okay, so then, uh, so we'll say s.sync and make our groups. All right, so we make the path, we boot the server, we load the buffer and add the synth thefts. We give the server a moment to breathe, and then we say, make this source group, make this reverb group, and uh, put a synth called tilde r uh, in that group. And oh, we don't have buses yet. Okay, so we're gonna have to right if we. It's still remembered from earlier, but if we're just opening Super Collider uh, cold, it's not gonna know what our bus is. It's gonna be nil. So. We should do that actually up here. It seems uh, a little bit unexpected, but these uh, bus objects are pure language side. The, um, the number of 
available audio and control buses is known and determined um, you know, before the server actually boots. So it's, it's fine to put these outside of the wait for boot function. Okay. And let's see if this works. We'll just see what we have right now. It shouldn't make any sound. You know, the only synth we're making is this reverb synth. Uh, so I'm going to do this and this. Oh, I think we can't actually um, make the node tree until the server is booted. So we'll just, we'll just run it. And now we'll make the node tree. That looks good. Yeah. We can also test our buffer. That worked. We've got our buffer. Uh, so we're in pretty good shape. Uh, the one thing we didn't do is MIDI. And MIDI is, again, pure language side. MIDI doesn't talk to the server whatsoever. It just talks to the language. And it's a little bit flexible, sort of where MIDI can go. I would definitely do this MIDI in dot connect all at the top somewhere. And we'll take this. Here's another example of a global variable that we just want to, you know, you know, give it a value immediately. No reason not to. And I think we can just put these right before the wait for boot. Doesn't really matter. We just have to put them after the connect all. Actually, we don't even have to do that. I think we can, we can define these MIDI receiver objects and their behaviors and then actually connect MIDI devices. So uh, you know, test, trust but verify. I'm not exactly sure that's correct, but um, let's, uh, let's save this. And I'm going to uh, disconnect my MIDI devices just to verify this works. So right now, active. Okay, now it's off. So we'll quit the server and we'll give this a try. And once it, once it runs, I think we should be able to play our keyboard and make some sampler synths. Let's find out. All right. We still have uh, the trace active. That's why it's being so talkative, I think. All right. So we're looking good. Right? Um, I would, I'm going to go ahead and say that this, this setup code is complete. We've got it all in one clump. And if we have the server quit, we just run it, and we're ready to go. Now, what happens if we press uh, command period? Actually, let's clean this up just a little bit. So if we're, we're like sort of in performance demo mode, maybe. Uh, so we're like, we've got our MIDI. And then we're like, oh, you know, maybe we have some stuck note or something, or we have something. We just, we just need a moment to think, so we hit command period. Now, it doesn't work. Two things have happened here. One, uh, the reverb's gone, and the groups are gone. So the, our, our nodes have vanished, and we need to, you know, go through and find them and and like we'd have to select and run this code again to get those back. But that's not even enough because MIDI def objects by default will not survive command period. They are impermanent. Um, so we'd have to make those again as well. All right, so we're now we're back in business, but this is annoying because every time we hit command period, we think, oh, I didn't mean to hit command period. Now I gotta manage stuff again. That's no good. So to fix the MIDI problem, we just make them permanent. MIDI defs, any, any kind of responder def, OSC defs as well, uh, they have a permanent flag, which is false by default. So now, if we quit the server, run it again, it works. And if we hit command period and then remake our groups and our effect, MIDI is still active. So that's one problem out of the way. The other problem I want to solve here is to get this code to automatically be reevaluated whenever we press command period. And there are three classes I want to introduce here which are very helpful for this sort of thing. I guess technically four. Server boot, uh, server tree, server quit, and command period. I'm not going to use all of these here. 
But all of these classes allow you to register functions as actions with each of these. So you can register functions with server boot, with server tree, etc. And whenever the action they represent is invoked, those registered functions get evaluated. So for example, um, let's say uh, um, uh, info equals command period was pressed. Okay. So we have this function called info, which when evaluated, posts the string command period was pressed. So we can say command period dot add info. And now whenever we press command period, it does this little action. It doesn't have to be just posting a string, it can be anything. Right? So you could make it so that pressing command period uh, evaluates these again. But I would actually be tempted to use server tree instead of, it's okay, probably okay to use command period here. Um, these three classes, server boot, uh, it's, you know, registers functions to be evaluated whenever the server boots. So you can register a function, boot the server, that function happens as soon as booting is complete. Server quit, stuff happens whenever the server is quit. And server tree registers functions which are evaluated whenever the, the server tree, this, you know, basically the, the, you know, the, the, the structure of the server is reinitialized. So command period implicitly does this. Um, so if you say s.freeAll or press command period or anything which erases all the nodes and returns the server tree to its default state, uh, acts as a trigger for all of server tree's actions. So what we're gonna do here, uh, well first we'll, we'll figure out how to remove uh, action. I think we say remove info. Right, now command period doesn't do that anymore. So we registered a function and then we unregistered it. So uh, server tree, and we're gonna call this uh, make nodes. And then we're gonna say server tree uh, dot add make nodes. And, and then here we can actually, uh, uh, if, we, if we run, if we quit the server and then run this, uh, it's not actually going to make those. This just defines the function and this registers the function, but uh, the tree initialization happened when the, as soon as the server booted. It happened a while ago. So now if we hit command period, boom, it works. We can do, we can do one better. We can manually uh, call, you know, uh, spoof basically this action by saying server tree dot run. Um, so uh, let's, um, let's say server tree dot remove, make nodes. Okay, so now command period, that action's gone. Command period is just clears the tree, nothing else happens. So I'll quit the server and run this one more time. And so now it defines the function, registers the function, and then causes the function to be evaluated. Aha. Right. We've got sound and command period clears the tree, but then it rebuilds itself. And now we're in a place where we're feeling pretty good. I think the only, the one thing I I think let's see what I, if we quit the server and run this again. Ah. <laughs> so the the problem is we've we've kind of inadvertently registered this function multiple times. So now, it's, I, I thought it was going to be two, but it's actually three. So if we quit uh, or quit the server, run it again, it's going to be four times. Uh, yeah, or five for some reason. Uh, so I think, let's see if we can. Yeah, this is a, you can, with, with any of these four classes, you can just say remove all, and that cleans it all up. So. A sensible thing to do, I guess, just in case, at the very top, just in case we have some weird stuff lying around. Right. Right. Uh, and so now, if we uh, 
we have sound. If we command period, still working. If we quit the server and run this again, uh, we're doing fine, right? And I think it might even be one step safer to, uh, to uh, well, I'm not sure. It's, I, I get a little wrapped up in, in, in knots here, but I'm, I'm tempted to uh, call this uh, cleanup and say server quit dot add cleanup. So that whenever we quit the server, this also happens. Um, you know, it's, it's a harmless thing to do. I think you can, it's no harm in doing this multiple times. Just like there's no harm in calling buffer dot free all multiple times. Actually, we can, we could just do, uh, just call the function right away. So we define the function, make sure it happens whenever we quit the server, and then run it right now, just to be certain. And then, then we move on with our code, and maybe this is a little bit overkill. Um, maybe not, who knows. But uh, we've, we've got our setup code. And so at this point, down here, we'd probably start building our performance code. And the strategy I usually like for performance code is to, at least for a chronological piece where there's event zero, event one, event two, is to um, create, maybe even in the, in, the, um, in, the, in the setup code here, an array. And this array is going to contain uh, functions. And I'm going to try to keep this very simple and say, uh, I will make one of these. Uh, so the, the first event, we make, we turn on one of these beep synths. Next one, we say sound zero dot set freak 500. And then finally, Turn it off, All right? Oh, I didn't mean to do that. I should probably uh, maybe s dot free all right at the top, just in case the server is on. Okay, yeah. so we wipe the nodes, start over, uh, and now we have this um, event structure. And again, this doesn't have to go here. I think this could might even make more sense to do it uh, before. We boot the server. So it's an array called events. So events at zero is a function, which we can evaluate. And events at one is another function, which we can evaluate. And say, so this is where it's the world's simplest composition. <laughs> turn on a sine wave, we change the frequency, and we turn it off. Um, but we've encapsulated the, the steps of our piece now in a, in a an ordered structure in an array. And so uh, at, at the very least, we can just do a line by line approach here. But you could just as easily make, um, make a, a simple GUI with a button. And the button has this many states. And every time you push the button, it plays the next event based on what state it's in. Um, you, can, uh, you can also have a counter. And then each, you know, like the, uh, the go function is uh, events at counter dot value counter equals counter plus one. Um, this can this can also go in the setup code because we're not actually making any uh, any sounds. And now while we oh uh, no yeah we did that we, we made counter equal to zero and now we just say go. There's our piece. So now we just have to hold shift and press enter. <laughs> the, there's a lot, I think there's more to discuss with regard to how to actually build a performance infrastructure. This one's very simple. It's just A, B, C, D. It just goes in order. Uh, and and you, uh, it takes a little bit of imagination, but imagine there's a lot more going on in these functions, right? The first, the first event would be, you know, playing six or seven interesting patterns that are panned. And, you know, there's like all these samples. You have a lot more samples than just the one sample. Maybe you have more effects. You can uh, set a bunch more parameters. But I think so many, a lot of pieces just boil down to 
creating synths, setting arguments of existing synths, fading out synths, or playing patterns or stopping patterns. And you can just do so much with those because those are just general structures. Uh, and that's, uh, and I think that's basically it. So I, I, I favor this. This is a nice structure. It's pretty, pretty foolproof, just an array of functions. Um, and you can pretty easily say counter equals zero to just reset everything. And then we're back here. There you go. And I kind of like not, uh, you know, this is like the sort of, so you don't accidentally start the piece over. We don't want to wrap the counter back to the beginning because you might <laughs> start, restart the piece. So this is pretty harmless. It's just going to, uh, you know, it's, it's uh, running, trying to evaluate a function that doesn't exist. So that's pretty harmless. Uh, all right. Well, I hope this um, makes sense and, and comes in handy in the future, maybe for your projects, maybe just for other reasons. But it's one of the things that I've seen people struggle with a lot, because you know how to make a sound in Super Collider, you know, but then how do you actually make a piece? How do you put it all together? And this, what I've tried to do here is just give you a rough framework that you can adapt based on the kinds of things you want to try. So that's it. This is our last class. Uh, it's been a pleasure. And I look forward to your final projects on the 10th. So I'll see you all then.